and Anthony Porter. I said, all right, I'll look at Anthony Porter. So I look at the Anthony Porter uh, files just, just cursorily, and I could see immediately that the wrong that had been, the, mis the injustice that had been committed in that case far exceeded anything that I've ever, ever come across in, in 27 years as a reporter. Well, one of the things you often have said is that you've never found a journalist who actually poured through the records of the Anthony Porter case. Can you comment on that? Yes, I, I'd be happy to comment on that. The, here, here's the problem. Um, I was at the Tribune at, during the Tribune salad days. It was an admired newspaper by Wall Street. It was uh, an ATM machine. It spit out money every year, record profits. Um, they, they had money to burn. And, and the, uh, the Tribune, which had gone public uh, shortly after I arrived, the stock was continued to go through the ceiling. It would split, blah, blah, blah. Different era. No internet. There were still four newspapers in town. And if, if an, an Anthony Porter kind of case came to the attention of the newspaper in that era, the city editor would call four, five, six reporters in and say, all right, all these, all these records are at Jimmy Sotos' office out in Itasca. I want to send a six, I want a six member team assembled. I want the six member team to go out there. I want the six member team to spend four months, get to the bottom of this thing, and we'll do an eight part series. Guess what? That doesn't happen any longer. Um, the Tribune, when I was there, had 800 people on the fifth floor city room. They're down to f less than 400. They're in Chapter 11. They're under reorganization. They, they have no money. They're bankrupt. Um, they're, they're laying off people left and right. And, it's, and it just gets worse. There are no raises. There's nothing. I, there's, well, I'll put it to you this way. There won't be newspapers in another four or five years, as we know them today. So. You know, I'm kind of ratcheting back. I, I, I still have my, my hands in, in, in some various other projects, and they're making me some money. Um, but I do have some free time on my hand, and I, 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 I sensed initially the, the utter outrage of what had happened here. And I, and I said to myself, there's no way a newspaper is going to go out to Itasca, by God, in this era. It's 35 miles away. And moreover, they're not going to send a six-member team out there. So I figured the simplest way to do this is put together a report um, on my own for nothing, package it, I hand it to the newspapers, and, 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 and all they have to do is drop a dime and see if the facts in my, in my report are correct, and they can run with it. What happened when you did that? Dead silence. Can you comment on that? Why? <clears throat> There, there, are, there are a number of reasons. Again, one of the reasons is, is, is just the lack of commitment, the lack of resources, the lack of manpower, the lack of money. Um, you know, I stay in touch with some people at the Tribune, and it's, 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 a, it's a factory over there. It's, it's terrible. Uh, reporters are doing four and five stories a day because they, they, they lack the manpower. So um, this was, even though I had put the report together, obviously they're not going to take my, my report as gospel. They're going to have to check the facts in it. My report was 100 pages long. It's 35,000 words, and um, it, it's going to require time. It's going to require co commitment. The papers don't have it. That is one reason, but that isn't the major reason. The major reason is this. The Chicago Tribune, the Chicago Sun-Times, the only two newspapers that continue to exist in the Chicago area along with the, the Herald, um, spent years um, investing emotion, uh, uh, intellectual efforts on the other side of this issue. The Chicago Tribune, um, you have to understand, in this era was absolutely behind the protest Innocence Project bandwagon. They won a Pulitzer for uh, taking the anti-death penalty rhetoric that was coming out of the Innocence Project without checking the facts. They took it as gospel, stuck it in the paper, and the paper won a Pulitzer for it. And, and in, in that era, 1999, when Porter was freed, um, the other news organizations in Chicago were, were, were equally committed um, to, to, to the Innocence Project. It was just unbelievable. Okay, so now all of a sudden, 10 years later, they've won Pulitzer Prizes, they've done five-part series time and again, and what a wonderful uh, work has been done in Medill and by protests and so on and so forth, 
And I gave them a report 10 years later, after they won all these awards, committed themselves to all this effort, um, and it, it says, you're dead wrong. You got it wrong. Now, the Tribune's going to stand up in the face of all this and say, we got it wrong? Can you, can you describe to me your experience of writing this report and trying to send it around and how you were received by various, uh, by various people you tried to get involved in it? Can you give us a description of what that was like? It all comes down to this, shoot the messenger. Wherever I t number one, this reporter went um, unsolicited to everybody in the Midwest that I thought um, was in a position to help in this matter, or, or at least had the inclination to help in this matter. It went to former U.S. attorneys. It went to every leading uh, criminal defense and former prosecutor attorneys in Chicago. It went to every uh, professor in the Medill School of Journalism. Um, uh, it went to the, the entire University of Chicago Law School, got a copy of this thing. Um, dead silence. I got, I got two responses, two, two meaningful responses. One was from Anton Volokas, the former U.S. attorney and a, at one time a very dear friend of mine. He responded in, with a one-liner, Bill, I read every word um, and I find it utterly fascinating. I got a response from Scott Turow, the author. Bill, is this true? Um, no journalist. I think a couple of journalists emailed me back saying, thank you, I'm taking a look at it. Went to the New York Times, went to the Chicago Tribune, went to the LA Times, went to the Chicago Sun Times, on and on and on, and essentially it was met with utter silence, which blows me away. If I'd gotten a report out like that as an investigative reporter in my, during my career, I would have gone absolutely bananas. Would you, would you say that some of the response you got was uh, even uh, uh, malevolent? Oh, oh it, 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 it became... Describe that a little bit? Yes, yes. Yeah. So after the report goes up... person with your credentials, I mean. Yes. But, but first of all, let me say this. My report is unique. Uh, from, from, from the standpoint of a reporter, in that it is, it is based entirely, entirely on the public record except for one utterance. There's one paragraph in there that comes from a third party. 99.99% .99 of that entire report is based on the underlying public record. It's not a third party saying, I think Porter was the, really the killer. It's based on the, the entire underlying record that has been generated uh, since these killings uh, occurred in 1982. It's, it's no third party saying anything. I'm, I'm sorry, what was that question? Oh, 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 uh, so, so... Um, Mark, can you go first? Do you mind, because you're leaning over here. Oh, I'm sorry. It, it, it just looks awkward for the camera. People are watching. Thank you so much. Okay, here we go, and go. So, um, after the report went out, and it was met with complete silence, um... I then began to um, follow up the sending of the report to these people with inquiries of my own. Um, and to the extent that, that those inquiries generated any response, they were in the nature of attack the messenger. I had protests, for example. He emailed me back. And, 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 and it was one of the most telling emails I've ever received in my life. He emailed me and he essentially said, uh, Bill, which of these eight addresses do you currently live at? And he had listed out all eight residences that I had lived in for the past 25 years, perhaps. He'd gone to the, I mean, he'd gone to the trouble to do that. Secondly, he says, I'm going to send Porter and his friends to the address that you currently live at. Please tell me which one it is. Now, here is a professor who, who, who is, is telling the entire world that Porter is an innocent man 
and that he's essentially a decent human being. He may have a couple of scrapes with the law, but a good guy at the end of the day, and certainly innocent. And he's going to set him to, to, to inflict harm on me. Well, uh, wouldn't you also say that, along, that there's an element of, of, of fear and embarrassment on behalf that explains a lot of these people's reasons why they attack you? No question about it. Can but, you describe that? Well, well but, here, but here is the thing. Here's the thing. You've got to remember. Um, they, they, don't, they haven't read the underlying record. None of these people know what the facts in this case. Not even some of the simple surfacey facts. So, so they can't engage me in any kind of meaningful discussion, any kind of meaningful debate, because they haven't read any of the underlying record. And so suddenly they get an email from me um, pointing out, for example, Porter's alibi witness presented at trial by a man who admitted to a jury that if instructed to kill somebody, to murder somebody, he, he, he would do it in a heartbeat because he was a gang member, and if Porter's told him to murder somebody, he'd get his gun and he'd go murder him. Now, they can't, these reporters can't debate this with me, so what are they left with? Attack him. He's, he's nuts. He's crazy. And by the way, Eric Zorn, you know, I ne never cared for the man, personally. But he and I, you know, s spent years together in the city room. I've won all these awards. He knows that. And so what is he saying? Crawford's, a f Crawford's insane. He's a fool. And um, um, you, you, the, some of pr protests and uh, Cialino, have they uh, threatened to sue you? Have they mentioned that they would like to sue you? That is the One interesting. Second. Hold your shot for a second there, right? Readjusting. Okay, starting from that is interesting. Go for it. Okay. That, that is really interesting because way high up in the report, I refer to Cialino as something of a two-bit investigator with a checkered past, and I back that up with a police report in which he went to a man's house in a south suburb uninvited, knocked on the door and said to the man, if you don't stop harassing my client, I'm going to put a slug in your head. Um, so he's charged with a misdemeanor. And anyway, um, uh, protest gets similar treatment. I point out how protests forged documents, lied to people, altered documents, um, uh, regularly uh, offered um, movie rights, book rights, huge fortunes to, to leading witnesses in various cases if they change their testimony. Not one hint that I was going to get sued by anybody. And uh, uh, why do you think they, that no one has sued you? Because truth is the best defense against libel. <laughs>